Hi, I'm Mike Warner, this year's president of the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. I would like to welcome you to the 2018 Candidates Forum in partnership with Medina TV. All candidates in contested races were invited to be interviewed. I'm pleased to be joined by Jared Fry of Medina TV for the interviews. We hope you find these interviews informative and helpful as you cast your vote. We would like to welcome Steve Hambly, candidate for the state representative for the 69th district, to the Greater Medina Chamber and Medina TV Candidates Forum. Let's begin by having you tell us about yourself. Sure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, well, for those that don't know me, I've been uh, I've been in Medina County a mere 63 years. Uh, a newbie. <laughs> pretty much only like uh, two months old when my uh, parents smuggled me in from Cuyahoga County. You didn't need passports back then. So, uh, but it, obviously, I've known no other county uh, and uh, love this uh, area. And I served as a councilman for five years in the city of Brunswick, and then also a county commissioner for 18 years, and 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 then at the same time, I was a college professor, taught for a number of years at Lorraine County Community College, and then retired in order to run for the state house. And this is uh, my second term. And at this point, I'm asking for voters uh, to return me. And uh, we'll, we'll talk further about what I think uh, the record has been, demonstrating that, that I've provided, I think, uh, the best representation possible for our county and, and, and for the communities uh, down at the state level and addressing many of the problems we have to. Very good. Well, this is a perfect segue into, can you describe a little bit about what a state representative does? What what are the, some of the things that uh, you get involved in? Well, as, it's interesting, interesting enough as, you know, kind of commissioner, you end up being much more also kind of like the executive administrative portion of it. As a legislator, uh, we are we are literally the legislative body. Uh, the General Assembly has a specific constitutional role. Uh, as they say, you know, the, uh, the, the governor, of course, he can propose things, and then the legislature or disposes of things, <laughs> uh, of what the governor proposes. And well, what our, our number one function constitutionally is to do a budget. Uh, everything else is on the table, obviously, that the Senate has an obligation in terms of confirming uh, executive uh, branch appointments. But other than that, constitutionally, we're required to you know, largely do the budget, which is obviously quite significant. But there's a whole lot else we do. And certainly, when, when you start talking about the complexity of, of uh, modern society and, and the laws and so forth, uh, we have have a lot of activity. Just this uh, past uh, General Assembly, we've got over 700 uh, House bills and over 300 uh, Senate bills that are go working their way, dealing with various problems that the communities face, uh, resources, uh, not just about finances and taxes, but also other things involving obviously criminal and civil laws and, and a, a lot of other uh, civil justice and other issues that, that we, we face. So a legislator largely has to be a generalist. There are certain areas we certainly have expertise and experience in. I, I bring in, obviously, an expertise in state and local government and local government uh, education is another one of my areas uh, and, and forte so I'm able to bring that but uh, large by and large I represent the constituents trying to get their uh, needs addressed uh, whether they be by virtue of legislation or if they require uh, some interface with our if you will bureaucracy with the executive branch we can act uh, somewhat on their behalf to uh, we can't direct the let's say ODOT to fill a pothole or to do sure. something <laughs> but we can ask the question why isn't that pothole hole filled. Right. Mm -hmm. Did we not give you enough money to right. fill that pothole? Sure. And so those are the kind of things that we get involved with or uh, solve a flooding problem that, that ODOT may be causing. Those are the kind of things uh, that we can do as advocates and ask. Uh, I found uh, as a legislator uh, uh, at least asking the question brings the light of day to then uh, quite often or not the executive branch and the bureaucracy or those that are in the administrative end will try to answer that question as best they can and then if it requires some changes in either administrative code or law and so forth, that we can address it that way. Or if they need, it's a budgetary issue, well, then we can talk about that as well. So our legislator, the way I look at it as, a, as being from the 69th District, I'm an advocate for uh, my constituents, for the communities. And when it comes to state laws that are being enacted or being considered, making sure that those various viewpoints are considered. That if we have uh, residents that have a deep concern with an issue that we don't believe is, be we don't believe is being addressed uh, adequately with legislation, that I can provide a voice to them, uh, whether it's a law that I get to vote on within committee or certainly as, in, with, as it works it through the process. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
And what do you feel are some of the challenges uh, that are facing that's facing the state of Ohio in this upcoming term? Well, this upcoming term, we continue to, well, we'll face some of the issues we had faced over the last four years. Certainly, the economy remains uh, an interesting one. Right now, we've gone from, uh, uh, un uh, well, unemployment was somewhat high. Now, we've got, basically, we've got to full near full employment and not enough people to work, certainly in terms of the skilled workforce. We hear uh, one of our top concerns of many uh, businesses uh, is that they have positions that they can fill, but they just don't have the skilled workforce. They don't have the people. Uh, uh, not only able with the skills they need, but also even able to 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 work. Uh, many failed even the drug tests that are that they, they they require and so forth. So that's an area that that certainly uh, we work with businesses and where we work continue to work with our education community in trying to address. And that likewise, we're talking about the drug tests. We have the opiate uh, epidemic still uh, is is a, a major issue that many of our communities and families are facing, our uh, as well as our medical institutions and so forth. Dealing Dealing with that issue continues to be a priority for the General Assembly. I, I am certain of that. Uh, the, there's other areas, that likewise, that we, we address when it comes to trying to coordinate some of the activities when it comes to education, uh, K through 12. We've had uh, some significant problems in education over the last number of years, uh, one of them being certainly uh, what I think has been the over-testing. Uh, and I think everybody kind of agrees that the, really we have started to emphasize too much the testing and not, not enough of the learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can keep measuring, the, the, you can keep measuring, if you will, uh, somebody told, was a farmer told me, you can keep weighing the pig, but it doesn't make the pig grow any faster by the more you measure it. So I'm not, just, I'm not uh, talking, uh, saying our children are pigs, but what I'm saying is, is the, we're, what we're really doing is we're starting to measure too much and really focus on that rather than what is actually going on, that, sure. that, that if you will, the learning process that we ought to be focused on. Uh, certainly school funding remains a, a huge problem uh, in, in terms of, I believe, an inadequate and a uh, formula that places uh, certainly Medina County and, and 69th District uh, uh, at a great disadvantage. We've, uh, at least historically, have been able over the last uh, two General Assemblies vote uh, twice on a budget that has increased funding for primary education and secondary education, but I've seen schools lose money uh, because of the way the formula, and, it's a, and really it's, it's, it's a dysfunctional formula. Uh, lastly, there's a grading card, uh, the, uh, the uh, card for school performance that does not adequately represent what is going on in the schools. Uh, uh, there are, are, and we could talk. Uh, I can talk with some detail about uh, the nature of that card and how we need to reform the measurement of uh, the performance of the schools. I know our schools and our children are doing a lot better than what that card says. Nobody believes the school card except for the Ohio Department of Education. I think maybe the superintendent and uh, the governor possibly. Yeah. But other than that, really, superintendents don't believe. Parents don't believe. Chambers of Commerce don't believe it because they're not adequately. And and, and there's good reasons to believe why this is, is dysfunctional and is really isn't a good measurement. Uh, that we just have to change that report card mm -hmm. system. So those are those are big ones we've got to work on, and obviously there's other ones that are more specific to our district. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of you did a great job of bringing up all the challenges. What would you classify as maybe your top three? Priorities as you as you would head into office. Well, I uh, one of the actually one of the challenges I'll say one of my next tasks is is I've been recently appointed uh, co-chair of a regional economic development uh, study committee, uh, and it was a bill that I had put in this last general assembly to, to evaluate metropolitan areas and and how regionally pe communities uh, and businesses and and uh, where we're talking about city governments and county governments and other district governments be able to work together cooperatively. And this study committee w will go on for the next year. I was just appointed co-chair of that. Uh, it, uh, our report is due next August, and you know, uh, Lord willing and the voters approve that I'm still around to be able to, to do that. I'll be uh, uh, shepherding uh, that through. And in that uh, committee, we are going to be going around the state, evaluating uh, various ideas to remove some of the barriers to cooperation that are out there that many people don't realize. Schools, uh, are, uh, between schools and even, I'll give you an example, schools and, and municipalities and so forth, being able to share school buses. Uh, Here's a public resource that, for many points in time, sit and are not being utilized, and yet they're, impe they're, 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 they're impeded by state law from being able to fully utilize that resource. And that's just one example. There's there's lots of examples, but we're doing is going to be casting a net, if you will, to with ideas and going around the state over the next number of months uh, to be able to generate more ideas and evaluate that, develop the work committees, and come back with a report for recommendations as to how we can better help cooperate the cities that do want to 
work with one another to promote economic development uh, and initiatives. And we're talking about public-private partnerships as well as public partnerships. And these are areas that we can fully explore I, 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 much more and I think uh, help identify where the state can play a very functional role in helping promote and even just remove the barriers to allow those kind of uh, alliances to occur. So that's one of my, obviously, priorities. That's what I've been assigned to do. And oh, the, my other co-chair is a senator from uh, Senator McCauley from, uh, from Northwest Ohio, Napoleon, Ohio, which is somewhat of a rural area. Mm -hmm. But we're, it's, it, but it is going to be statewide, and we're going to be do, engaged in that. Mm -hmm. Other areas that I'm certainly interested in is continuing uh, for, further on, on uh, trying to find a better formula, if you will, for education funding. Likewise, we still have the other uh, the other challenges involving the report card. Uh, I hope is actually we can kind of address that with a new governor on board. Hopefully, we'll be able to address some of the other issues that involve education. Uh, certainly, the oversight of the uh, community schools, uh, the funding, and uh, the travesty that occurred with uh, ECOT, uh, uh, and that has to be avoided. And we have to go in there and, and, and further clean up uh, that and make sure it's much uh, much more transparent and there's accountability for the the use of public funds for school for children. Mm -hmm. So those are areas that we need to focus on, and I'll continue to, to, to work on, as well as continue to represent, obviously, the interests of the district. Sure. Uh, this General Assembly, and I, could, I know it's a long answer, this General Assembly, I, I introduced 18 bills. Ten of them are now law. Uh, ten of them involve, of, oh, almost all those involve local input. They came from local constituents, superintendents, from individuals. Uh, a guy at a produce store that I met with uh, that brought up an issue uh, over at the, and Mark's uh, the produce. Uh, dealing with these issues and coming back and saying, hey, that's something we can do. They're very focused, but they, 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 they can get things done. My hope is actually of those 18, uh, even with the 10 accomplished, I've got at least two or three I think we ought to be able to get accomplished so by the end of the year. Okay. So so next year I'll have a new list of things that individuals have brought forward to me. Hopefully we can find fixes for those and address those issues. And if I can find, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, certainly continue to work with other leg legislators such as uh, Senator Larry Aboff and, and Daryl Kick, who also represents Medina County, to get those things done. Very good. Very good. I know you've uh, I've seen you a lot at a lot of ribbon cuttings in mm -hmm, the area mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, supporting the businesses here. Sure. Um, what types of things that you can do? You, you mentioned workforce. What, what types of things do you think you can put in place for the workforce? Because there is, while while unemployment is down, there's mm -hmm, this challenge mm -hmm. to trying to find the right people for the right jobs. Sure. What do you think? Some of it, I think, uh, it, it are not solutions that are going to come from the top on down. It's actually promoting solutions from the local area. And that's mm -hmm. the one thing I've found, is what we really need to do more at the state level. Now, certainly we, in, in budgetary, we can promote and continue to provide to help provide funding. But also uh, uh, make sure that, that we are supportive of the local efforts. The best ideas end up being what the, what the chamber's doing. Part of the issue of workforce development and, and, and workforce training ends up being cultural. In other words, you have parents who actually consider that, it, that that it's, their kid isn't being successful if it goes to a trade school, right. that he's more successful, he or she is more successful if they go to a college. Well, obviously, I, I come from a kind of a trades family. All my brothers and sister and so forth went both through the career center. And, 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 and so I feel that if you end up working with your hands, you can make a good living, and certainly with the skilled trades. And that ends up being with trying to support those efforts where we're, in, in effect, influencing parents, letting them know, look, a child going out there and going to the career center and coming out of HVAC is going to earn Fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. straight out, and go. Oh, but they're going to continue their education. They can actually promote themselves. Continue if they want to do something else beyond that. This is the next first of many steps. Mm -hmm. uh, my own personal experience. I, I worked my way through college. Uh, I, uh, when I went, I graduated high school to get my PhD. It took me twenty-one years because I was working full time and going sure. to school part time. Uh, I didn't start the path of becoming an academic. I actually worked in the private sector for a number of years, so I got my master's degree. In, in, in history so I could then become a, a history professor in social studies. I was much more in a, in a field of, of uh, science. I was with the testing laboratory for a number of years. And those are technical skills and so forth. And you take those technical skills with you wherever you go. But it enabled me to have earn a living, to be able to move to what I really want to do. And so they end up being communicating with people much further, the parents as well as the kids, that your path and your career is just not the one and first and final step. 
have. Right. It's one of growth and personal growth of what you find for fulfillment. I found fulfillment in obviously teaching and of course public service. There are those opportunities that kids can have too and going through the trades gets them to the next level. Mm -hmm. I know when I taught at the Lorraine County Community College, one of the brightest students I had was in taking political science and he was working at a car dealership but he wanted to become a lawyer and so I know I'm not sure they're both the same but <laughs> <laughs> there are verbal skills in both but he was working at a car dealership but he worked his way up from the ground level. He had right. actually started in cleaning up the cars and doing all the you know everything they do to need to prep them and he ended up working then started working on the floor and working in, in the parts department learned it and he learned the trade but he was working way through college so he could go ahead and go to law school and that's that's I haven't heard from from him um, since but I, I will bet you dollars to donuts he he's gonna he's gonna make it yeah. he really is and you got to be proud of somebody like yeah. that and that's the kind of thing what we need to do is encourage certainly at the state le state level to continue to tell that story to help the local people tell that story and encourage it that's part of the solution it's not like we can create this one program top-down programs don't necessarily they, they can be helpful but those are not the answer right very good now you did a great job of talking about the, the testing and the ratings for the school system. Sure. And you kind of touched on the, the funding issue. I want to kind mm -hmm. of get back into the funding side sure. of things. Uh, I guess kind of the issues with the, the charter schools and the mm -hmm. funding there, mm -hmm. not to mention just the normal funding for public schools. Mm -hmm. Do you see any type of solution or answer anywhere in the near future? Well, actually, over the last year, year and a half, uh, Representative Cup, who used to be actually, a, 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 well, it was not only a state rep, a state senator, but also a Supreme Court justice, mm -hmm. And now he has uh, been heavily involved in education for many, for, for many years. He and, and Representative Patterson, who's a Democrat, helped lead a panel, uh, actually a study group that we've been involved with for, well, like, like I said, last year and a half, that involves superintendents and school treasurers and basically school officials all over Ohio. Uh, and we're coming out within the next month with actually a, a, a report talking, and it was specifically about funding mm -hmm. and about the, the, the change in funding. And there are some recommendations in Involved in that, that we hope that we could start at least start the ball rolling. This general assembly not likely going to pass anything, but at least start the discussion. Mm -hmm. So the next general assembly, we can start actually addressing and creating a, a, a more equitable formula. Number one, certainly one of the big issues ends up being the community school funding that is taken out of the local for districts like Medina County is taken out of the local, mm -hmm. that actually there'd be more direct funding for it as opposed to funding that's taken out of the local tax base. So in other words, if the state wants to fund that, it would end up being specifically for uh, uh, community schools so that if a student, that the money is going to follow the child, that the money will be there so mm -hmm. that, that people have an option. That if you want your child, your child has special needs or you have a special desire that you want to go elsewhere, they don't have to be a prisoner, if you will, at the local public school. Right. They have an option and the state can help facilitate that without costing the local district mm -hmm. and so there's proposals in there for that there's other ways that an adjustment of formula that actually changes whole formula that basically it's a Robin Hood formula it takes from the rich mm -hmm. and gives to the poor and that's the problem we kept pu putting more money in on the last two general assemblies and it was just siphoning Good from thing. from the wealthy and Let's face it, Medina County, we're going to be wealthy districts. Mm -hmm. we, we are. We are the wealthiest. Uh, uh, when you look at Highland, you look at Medina and Wadsworth, they're, compared to everybody else, we're always going to be in the wealthier, which means we're going to gain the least. Mm -hmm. We're not getting the state average. We're getting well below. Even our poorest district gets well below the state average. Mm -hmm. So changing that and doing what's called base cost, which is hopefully a model that was done a couple decades ago, is, is a means for us to kind of return to that and say, at the base level, this is the minimum level you're going to get funded. Ultimately, that should increase the funding to the districts like in Medina County, uh, the wealthier areas. And so that's those are proposals that are going to be coming out here within the next month. The report is being finalized. It involves uh, it, a lot of people looking at it, certainly, like I said, superintendents and treasurers throughout the state, as well as a number of state representatives. Though those are areas we're going to have to continue to work on, but that's, that's going to be challenging uh -huh. because it's, it, obviously you have to have the budgetary needs to be able to do that fortunately we've had a growing economy uh, we've been doing very well we've had uh, money going into the uh, what we call the rainy day fund or the budget stabilization fund but likewise you have a new governor coming in and the new governor is going to have uh, a, a specific vision as to how they deal with that want to deal with education so the governor and obviously the legislature is going to have to work on those issues uh, governor Kasich had a, his own vision and likewise uh, this new governor is going to have I'm sure a different vision about how school funding ought to be done 
hopefully the legislature and a group of us working together can make it more equitable for those of us that have been on the short end of the mm -hmm. stick for too long. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Shifting gears a little sure. bit, uh, and we've talked about health um, workforce and, and the school funding. Now, a little darker side, what about the opioid crisis that's occurring? Do you see any um, assistance being done at the state level well, with we, regards to that? We've actually done quite a bit. I mean, when we look at the uh, the last uh, at the last uh, uh, budget, uh, when we did the budget bill, uh, House Bill 49, uh, two years ago, we put a hundred and almost 190 million dollars more into uh, basically trying to develop an, uh, a comprehensive approach to opiates. In other words, not only when it comes to enforcement, but also treatment as well as prevention programs. Uh, and, and it is a complex program that involves basically what they say all hands on deck. It, but it's one that I think still, once once again, it ends up being at the local level, trying to do it. Now, let me give you the, this analogy, and this is kind of how I see the approach of our state government work. Have you ever heard of Smoke Jumpers? Smoke Jumpers was a program that was out, out west, it started in 1944, they emphasized it uh, World War II. But basically, the high idea, whole idea is you have a small group of people that are on planes, this is for forest fires and right. so forth, and there's a lot going on there last this summer with a lot of you know, woods being burned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but in 1944, it lasted until 1981. Basically, they would go and when they saw smoke, was reported, they'd load these uh, people up, these, these smoke jumpers, two or three in at a time, and they'd dro drop them at low altitude with limited equipment and put out the fire while it was small. Sure while it was small, and they devote the resources they could while it was small. And in other words, and rather than let it go to the point where nobody can manage it. In 1981, they eliminated that program. In 1980 and 81, they reduced the funding, and then they eliminated it. And I saw a graph showing where before smoke jumpers in 1944, hundreds of thousands of acres in the area were, were destroyed every year. Sure. When they were in existence, it was like 100 acres <laughs> or something. But up to 1981, then after 1981, it's gone back up to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of acres being destroyed because they're not stopping it while it's small. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the problem we have. So the best idea for the state resources is to come in and assist the local community, the local family, local organizations while the problem is small. Not wait until it goes into a wildfire where you basically have to make a decision, well, we can only devote the limited resources here and we have to let this one burn. Right. Our society is full of a lot of our problems in a lot of areas. So my idea, is, and certainly the way I've envisioned and the way I've tried to approach is, we need to be smoke jumpers. We need to come in to help the local community. When it comes to unemployment, help them deal with it at the, at the local level. Help them look at it at the county level. Don't wait until it's, it's widespread. Uh, opiates are the same problem. In other words, let's try to get, help provide them the resources so they can help in a very limited fashion basically keep it so it is a small. You're going to have, if you will, naturally the lightning strikes. You're going to have the natural fires. You're going to have the natural disasters. You're going to have all these kind of things. State resources ought to be brought in to help the locals deal with those pinpoint. and pinpoint. And therefore, you don't, it's going to require less state resources, hopefully, or at least keep mm -hmm. it from becoming a raging fire. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kind of, th that's, I, I know it's a, kind of a broad analogy, but one, hopefully, you can say that's really what I think, and opiates we need to continue to do. Identify Identify where you have that problems and devote the resources as best we can to deal with that at, at the local level. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now we've discussed a lot of issues here that sure. you've been bringing up, uh, and a lot of that's going to require a lot of the parties working together, Republican, Democrat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you you mentioned there's a new you know, re new governor coming in, sure. Uh, how do you feel that working relationship will be if that governor is someone uh, from the opposite party? Well, it'll be different. Uh, there's, there's, uh, <laughs> I, w I would say, you know, we've we passed uh, about 190 some 197 House bills uh, and 37 Senate bills this past General Assembly. 95% uh, of them are bipartisan. 95%. So I think that with a new governor uh, and Obviously, I'm pr promoting my guy. I mean, I, you know, uh, no doubt I'm Republican, I'm, and I think that that's going to be the best situation. If, for whatever reason, that it's not, we'll have to work with that new governor in, in a way that uh, makes sense. There is always a historical, uh, regardless of whose office, whether it's Republican or Democrat, a tension between the the executive and the, and the, and the basically legislative branch. Mm -hmm. uh, the legislature, uh, like at the federal level, has given a lot of authority to the executive branch. And 
and there's always that struggle for the General Assembly to try to take it back, particularly when it comes to administrative administration of the programs like Medicaid expansion was another was one example where we have more control. The bureaucracy itself, uh, there's always an expansion. I can I can cite a, at least a couple examples where the Department of Taxation over the last several years has expanded the definition of taxes you know, beyond what the General Assembly. So we'd have to go in and we'd have to come in there and reclarify the law as to no that tax does not apply to natural gas for residents within a municipality, municipality that are in a municipal system because the tax department decided that they were going to reinterpret the code from 20 years prior and assess a four million dollar tax bill oh. on a village of 200 people <laughs> and it's like it was in, insane. So, the, but that's the kind of tension we will always have, mm -hmm. and will continue to have, where the General Assembly will assert its authority as it should in creating the law, and of course, uh, in in the bureau, the executive department's interpretation of that law. Mm -hmm. So, you're always going to have that, and I, I think you will, will continue to have that. But I I see there will be opportunities for for uh, working together. Uh, but I think there's still, even with a Republican governor, we're going to have that same tension mm -hmm. as we had the same tension with sure. the Republican governor now. Sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. In closing, is there anything you'd like the viewers to know? Uh, yes, I, I'll, I'll just say I just uh, thank the voters uh, and the constituents of the 69th District for giving me the honor and the opportunity to, to serve you over the last, uh, now this is my fourth year, representing you in Columbus. Uh, indeed, it's been one of the best jobs I ever had. Uh, enjoy working uh, every day uh, on it. Uh, every day is a, a new thrill, a new challenge. Uh, but I always uh, I, I take a look at my history in, in Medina County and take a look and say that we've always had good representation from the county. Uh, uh, fortunately, I've had uh, great predecessors, uh, Bill Bashelder and, uh, and Chuck Calvert and others, uh, to kind of still uh, talk to and, and, and model from, and a great group of local officials to rely upon, uh, at county government, at, at local government, and I think that's that our strength is, and it remains, I will continue to tap into that, and uh, as well as uh, relish the thought that I've got also constituents that can provide me with some insight and then when my, my list gets cleaned up of the 18 bills that I if I can get that up and all, all passed I'll have a brand new list because I'm sure the constituents will come up with things that I know need to be done and I'm there to meet the challenge well thank you very much for your time today and wish you the best of luck this November thank you appreciate it thank you